Hi everyone. Uh, I am Kenju from Media Product Development Team, and today I'm going to talk about front-end re-architecture of a DKLO Rails app with BFF, GraphQL, and React. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Kenju. Please call me Ken. I am the backend engineer uh, developing the online ad delivery system in Kubebot. My expert is programming server-side uh, system with Ruby, Golan, and AWS. Recently, I am passionate about, about streaming pipeline, such as a real-time log analysis. Here are my recent presentation. If you find any interesting keywords, please talk to me later. All right, before jumping into the main topic, let me show you what kind of ad we have. Uh, Cookpad is a recipe platform. We deliver values not only to users, but we also deliver values to clients. Main clients are food companies. They want to appeal their new product to users, and this is where Cookpad comes in. I am showing you some of our famous ad products. This is one of the main ad formats called Category Page Hijack. This hijacks the whole page when you're searching. Here are sponsor tie-up content. The format is simple. Once you click on them, you go to the client's landing page about their new product. And here is a one-day uh, one site hijack. On the particular day, all web, iOS, and Android are all hijacked. This is a popular product, especially on Christmas, Halloween, or Valentine days. And we also offer a targeting options, user segment-based targeting, which is called EAT, and customized segments, and shopping time hijack. Right, now I'm gonna talk about the architecture of the Cookpad ad system. This is an old version of the architecture. In the left side is uh, Admin app, which is a DKL Rails application, and in the right corner is a Cookpad application, which is also Rails. An operation team submit creative on the Admin app, and BAT server frequently write to Cookpad's MySQL databases. The Cookpad application will deliver plans from MySQL per request and then deliver ads to PC. We have a separate API server for mobile clients, uh, which is called Pantry internally, but it works in the same way. And here is a newer version for del delivering ads. We have an ind independent ad delivery system. The ad deliver the ad logic is extracted from the Cookpad applications. There are another batch jobs uh, to write delivery plan to another MySQL. The thing is, we, the database YAML of the admin app has four database configuration. One is for its own admin app, one for Cookpad, one for new ad delivery app, and the last one is for Redshift, we, which is our data warehouse platform. Okay, then how old are you, the admin app? This is the first commit of the Git. Uh, it was 2008, and actually, the initial commit is an import from SVN. So, uh, but fortunately, the former team members did a lot of great refactoring. The code base is not as large as the Cookpad application. Still, it is so hard to maintain. Actually, there are different versions for domain models. Some are used in common, some are used only for old way, and the others for new one. I didn't want to edit the app anymore, so it took me so long to understand the overall architecture. They are in coherent business logic implementations, like from controllers, services, view helpers, view models, and moreover, JavaScript was not maintainable as well. For example, jQuery major version is one, and the latest is three, there are many not used dependencies in the package JSON, and many migrations were on the way. For example, CoffeeScript and ES6 coexisted. Moreover, there was no JavaScript unit testing. So, this is where BFF comes in. What is BFF? Uh, BFF stands for Backend for Frontend. BFF is one of design patterns. BFF is coined by Sam Newman, the author of Building Microservices, I think this is kind of a famous book. And the definition is single purpose edge services for UIs and external parties. 
The idea is simple. Instead of building general purpose server-side API, BFF proposed to build client-side oriented services. It's like a presentation layer for front-end. Then, why you need BFF? Please have a look at this gray slide by Yosuke Furukawa, one of Node.js contributors in Tokyo. He says there are mainly three use cases. The first one is to accelerate development for front-end and back-end developers. And secondly, it's for special use cases which is required BFF, such as server-side rendering for SEO or WebSocket for real-time app. And the last one is to re-architect legacy system. And this is exactly our use case. Then, how can we implement BFF? The answer is, and BMG. What is BMG? Boys and girls, no, BFF meets GraphQL. Right. So what is GraphQL? GraphQL is an open source query language created by Facebook. It gives clients more control over what, it, what information is required. The key feature is GraphQL is not opinionated about the network layer, payload formats, nor the application architecture, which means that uh, basically GraphQL is used with HTTP and JSON response formats, but you can also another uh, network layer and another uh, payload format. And GraphQL is only a query language. Here is a sample architecture diagram from howtographql.com. This is a good start, starting point for GraphQL. The key point is you can encapsulate the behind a business logic and migrate legacy system with the current service gradually. OK, let's go back to our Admin app. This is the same slide I've shown you already. And here is a new architecture. We build a GraphQL layer in front of the admin app and migrating to GraphQL endpoint gradually. And we encapsulate the legacy systems. systems. And in the near future, we're going to remove all old models. And we are country working on it. Let me explain more about GraphQL. Here is a query operation example. In the left side, you can query this is a DSL, and in the right side is a response in JSON. Just writing any attributes you want in the client side, and that's it. JSON response includes exactly what you want in the response field. And here is an example of GraphQL schema. The GraphQL schema can be found in the left side, which is a strict D-typed. And actually, if you use a GraphQL gem, which is uh, very famous if you build a GraphQL server in Ruby. Uh, that this is generated by the Ruby implementation in the right side and powered by GraphQL gem. And here is a minimum example of query implementation. And all you have to do is to declare a query type with field annotation and write resolver method. And how about the controller? And here is the minimal implementation for GraphQL controller. And of course, you have to do much more for adding mutation, not only query or subscription, and adding logging, timeout, and error handling. But this is at very a minimum example. Right, so this is our team's GraphQL design principle. First, GraphQL server should be as thin as possible. Why? Because uh, this is an advice by Lee Byron, the co-creator of GraphQL and ex-Facebook uh, engineer. We do not write many tests for GraphQL because if you feel you want to test your GraphQL, then it is a sign that GraphQL layer is becoming fat. We also try to implement gradually. In other words, schema should not be general purpose. It should focus on solving client problems. Let me share some development tips. Here are recommended tools for GraphQL development. The first one is GraphQL. This is very famous too and integrate with GitHub GraphQL API version 4 online, so some of you may know already. The next one is GraphQL Docs, which generate documentation. And finally, GraphQL Voyager, 
Let me tell you one by one. First of all, GraphQL and GraphQL Rails is a must-have tool. GraphQL is, is like an IDE for GraphQL. It supports documentation explorer, uh, tab completion, and query history. I also recommend GraphQL Docs. You can build a static page from your schema file. This is much more readable than schema file because it supports a color highlight and in-page links. Finally, one more thing, GraphQL Voyage is an interesting tool for visualizing schema. This visualizes each graph's relationship with edge, edges and nodes, and this enables you to think business logic in graphs. So thinking models in graph is a very important note if you build a GraphQL server, because schema file is flattened, but it is graphs all the way down. GraphQL Voyager help, helps you to define your model in node and graphs. And next, how about JavaScript? We enhanced a lot of things in JS2. This shows before and after of our refactoring. We introduced a snapshot testing with JS. JS is one of the framework, it's like a Kalma. And why snapshot testing? Because you can write effective tests with low development cost. And we replace all coffee script with pure ES6. Migration was on the way, so we update the ES link rule for that. We still rely on jQuery, but introduce a migration way to React and Apollo. Apollo is a client library to bind GraphQL data and React. Apollo is not opinionated for Vue frameworks, so you can use Apollo with Vue, Amber, and Angular. And finally, React 3 book is also introduced for a behavior-driven development. First, uh, what is snapshot testing? Snapshot tests are very useful too whenever you want to make sure your UI does not change unexpectedly. Once you write a snapshot test, like in the left side, and the snap file will be generated, like in the right side, this snap file should be tracked by Git. If the snapshot changes, test will fail. Test will ask you whether it is intentional or not. The problem is you cannot test complex events with Jest. If you want to test complex user events, you have to write feature spec or integration specs. But this is very handy. And next, we also reviewed ESLint rule. ESLint supports ES6 oriented rules, so we aggressively turn on these rules, along with ESLint recommended and React recommended plugins. This is good, especially for junior engineers who just began learning JavaScript. And finally, React 3 book, Storybook is a development environment for UI components. It allows you to build a component library. It's like a catalog. You can check simple events on the catalog. And yes. And we also define defining about design guidelines. The key concept is this. First of all, design guidelines should improve our developer experience, or DX. Developing the internal admin app should be a valuable experience for our team members. And secondly, we avoid the bleeding edge. Since there are no dedicated front-end engineers, we should take care of future maintenance costs, even thinking about when I left this team. Lastly, I try to lay the rails for junior and future developers. The goal is, once you see the code, you will know how you write. And to achieve this, we basically follow well-known best practices instead of reinventing the wheel. Here are some key components of our design guidelines. We rely on bootstrap because we do not want to maintain CSS definitions. And we introduce atomic design for components development. Let me explain more about atomic design in the next slide. Atomic design is methodology for creating design systems. There are five distinct levels in atomic designs, which are atoms, molecules, organism, templates, and pages. Molecules are composed from multiple atoms. Organisms are composed from multiple atoms and molecules, and so on. We separated directory structure for each component. Here is 
our atomic design guideline. I think how to separate each component depends on each team and application. This is our guideline. For example, atoms are minimum components like button, input, or toast. Molecules are composed of atoms and can handle single events like pager. And organisms can handle multiple events like complex form or charts or use GraphQL provider. And templates and pages are used per action and view. Finally, let's discuss about how to fight with legacy. Our decade all raised up is so-called legacy. Original members have already left the team. I became friends with GitLab and GitLog. Sometimes I found in background issues in GitHub, and there is a link to a third-party service like uh, Campfire and Slack. But unfortunately, we do not use Campfire anymore, so I cannot read the documentation behind a background. And there are multiple versioning from delivery, targeting, and web iOS and Android SDK have separate versioning. Moreover, there is no refactoring expert in a team. That's why we have been refactoring with a 20% rule. In the first place, what do you feel if you have to maintain a DK or raise up? And it's harder to maintain because there are a bunch of mysterious code with monkey patching, so frustrating to add new features because somehow feature spec failed. It takes so long to grasp the whole architecture. But is the legacy system evil? I don't think so. It may be legacy, but this is the core com competence of your company. That's why, the minds, uh, that's why the mindset of refactoring is important. You should be respectful to the current code base because this is why you are and why I receive salary. And at the same time, do not think from the current code base. Think from the ideal specification. Do make, do make a decision from current code base requirements member skill levels, impact range, and risk of changes. And moreover, don't confuse means and ends. Why you need to refactor, for our case, it is to drive business growth. The type system, stick analysis, microservices, implementing GraphQL, CI, and CD, they are all means, not ends. Let me tell you our step to fight with legacy system. Firstly, let's understand the application. And let's get familiar with the current code base and domain logic. Exploratory refactoring is a good methodology to understand the code base. Do not refactor drastically in the first place. In the next step, let's visualize quality with tests. Tests themselves do not improve the quality. Tests just visualize the quality of your application. Then how to improve the quality? The answer is programming and re-architecturing. Writing tests are the preparation step for them. And finally, do refactor. Unfortunately, there is no silver wallet. As I always said, Roma was not built in a day. At the same time, this is an exciting part for me because you can put all your knowledge and experiences into refactoring from design patterns, paradigm like OP, encapsulation, and so on. Oh, this is our final slide. Uh, let me introduce my favorite quote from this book. Uh, when the future cost of doing nothing is the same as the current cost, postpone the decision. Sometimes, please avoid from refactoring it now, even how much you want to change the code base. Go do focus and be productive. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ken. Does anyone have a question? I'm going to bring you the mic. To refactoring, um, is this your team decision or business team decision? I mean, how do you convince business team to give a green light to refactoring the whole thing? Would you, would you repeat the first part, please? Um, to keep it short, how do you convince business team to allow you to do refactoring this big because it's going to take times if uh, we don't change the uh, behavior or the ui views uh, 
we don't have a much communication with business team because okay. yeah, it, it is our uh, scope to refactor our code base and improve development experience. But of course, if we wanted to delete some features or do uh, do uh, taking a long time refactoring, I consult. We consulted with the business team and I asked them to. Uh, give us, uh, for example, one week to do a refactor or so. Thank you. No? OK. Thank you, Kenju. Oh, sorry. Uh, it was a good talk. Um, so I, I'm one of the people who is behind the, I'm one of the non-team people, I used to write some of this code, but um, I'm just wondering, how far along are you in this process? Because you covered a lot of ground, and there are a lot of things to be doing, so like, how long did it take you? And as he was saying earlier, refactoring takes time, right? And um, it ends up being a trade-off, are you gonna move the business forward, or are you gonna clean, clean up the developer experience? You have to make a choice, right? So. I'm just wondering like how far along you are, how much time you've spent, and is it just that 20% time or is it more than that? Okay, so it took almost a year uh, and I used my 20%, so I joined this team last October, last year's October, and I realized that there, wow, there are so many legacy systems and I couldn't understand at all, so but I have to add a new features. I have to develop a new services. So I use 20% rule. Uh, because using 20% rules for anything you want is our team slogan. Uh, so I choose a refactoring legacy system as my goal. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You have mentioned many times this 20% rule. Can you please explain a bit what it means? So it is a kind of, mm, it's like a Google introduced a 20% rule that every uh, employers do anything you want uh, in your work time, but it has to be different from your main project. Does it make sense? Yeah, basically, we can use 20% of our time, like one day a week, to uh, to work on the projects we want. I guess it depends on team, on the teams. How do you do it, Ken? Our 20% rule? Oh, of, of, we didn't count our time, so it, around 20%, yeah. <laughs> but I don't know exactly. Nice. Is there any other question? All right, thank you, Kenju. Second round of applause, please.